Welcome back to AP Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug, and this video is all about determining oxidation state of atoms, or the charge of atoms in any uh, compound or ion that you might encounter. Now, how do we do that? Well, there are several simple rules. These are in order from the easiest, and they work their way up to some more complex rules. So let's start with the easy ones here. Elements that are sitting by themselves always have an oxidation state or, or charge of zero. So what does that mean? Well, if you see just a plain old atom sitting around here like zinc, well, we know that that is going to be zero. You know, it's not an ion in solution. It's just a, a, a solid metal. It is zero. Or iron. We, we've probably learned about how iron, when it's in solution, can be plus two or plus three or who knows what else. Well, when it's a metal, just plain old iron, it is zero. So don't let that fool you. Oxygen. The same way, when it's plain oxygen gas, that's a charge of zero. Or we have these uh, multi-atomic elements like uh, phosphorus in this case. Phosphorus is still zero because it's an element hanging out by itself. Now, if you ever see an, an ion, ions that are by themselves take whatever charge they happen to be labeled with. So for example, if we have zinc ions here, Zinc, well, you see a plus two there. That's a dead giveaway that it's a positive two. Or iron, three plus. You know, well, that plus three right there tells us it's a positive three. I know that this seems kind of elementary and maybe obvious, but sometimes we need to review that. Oxide, if you see a negative two right there, well, it's got a negative two charge. And phosphide, you see a negative three, well, that means it's got a negative three charge. So ions are usually pretty easy to figure out as well. If you have a compound, alkali metals are gonna be positive one, and alkaline earth metals are positive two, which you probably already knew from first year chemistry, but it's always good to review that. So in sodium chloride, we know that the sodium right there is going to have a positive one oxidation state. Or calcium fluoride, if we're focusing on the calcium there, we know that's going to be positive two because it's in the second group of the periodic table. Or we can look at lithium nitride. If we're focusing on the lithium, well, it's in group one, so it's got a positive one charge. Now, all compounds have a total oxidation state of zero, and any polyatomic ion is gonna have a total oxidation state of whatever its charge says it is. And so you wanna solve these like a puzzle. You wanna use the oxidation states that you know to solve for the ones that you don't know. So an example of that would be, here's our NaCl again. If we know that Na is a positive one, well, if the whole compound is neutral, that means that chloride would have to be negative one. Now you probably already knew that already from looking at the periodic table, but here's another way to figure it out. If we have that calcium fluoride once again, we said earlier that calcium is a positive two, and so that means that the fluorides altogether would have to be negative two. And we have two of them, so that divides out to be negative one for each of them. That gets us the total negative two. And then the zinc nitride. Well, we know that zinc is going to be plus two, isn't it? We learned that in first year chemistry and in a few lessons ago in this course. And so we've got three of those. So plus two, we got three of those. So that's a total of plus six. And since this is a neutral compound, the nitrides have to be a total of minus six so that that evens out. We divide that by two and you get negative three for each of those. So hopefully you can see that oxidation state, it's like solving a puzzle. Use the ones that you know to solve for the ones that you don't know. Now, oxygen in a compound is always going to be negative two. There's one exception to that. It's if you ever have peroxide, and we'll see that a couple times, perhaps in the practice homework assignments, oxygen in a peroxide is gonna be negative one. So as an example of that, you know, we have Fe2O3, so that means oxygen has got to be negative two, and we have three of them there. So that means it's a total of negative six. So the irons have to be 
positive 6. And we have two of those, so that divides out to positive 3 for each of them. Or we could look at carbon dioxide. You know, car we have carbon dioxide here, and the oxygen is minus 2. We've got two of them. So that's minus 4. Well, that means the carbon would have to be positive 4 to balance out those charges. Or we could look at dinitrogen tetroxide. You know, oxygen is minus 2, and we have 4 of them this time. So that's a total of negative 8. That means that the nitrogens would have to be positive 8. Now we divide that by 2. There are two atoms, and so that's positive 4 for each of them. So as you can see, we use what we know to solve for what we don't know. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is usually a positive 1. That's because it's bonded to nonmetals most of the time. Every now and then you'll find a hydride, which is a hydrogen bonded to a metal. In that case, hydrogen would be a negative 1. So if we have HBr, we know that hydrogen is going to be positive 1, which means the bromide would have to be a negative 1. Or we could look at this example, calcium hydride. Well, calcium is bonded to a metal in this case, so hydrogen is going to have to be a negative 1. We got two of them. So that means the calcium is going to be positive 2 to balance that out. So as you can see, some of these rules kind of link into each other. You could have figured out one from you know, either one of these. But it's nice to have multiple rules so we can figure out the oxidation state of every single atom in these compounds and in these ions. Well, here's another rule. You know, sometimes it's not going to be obvious. You know, perhaps you'll have two, uh, two elements that could have multiple oxidation states. Well, if you're ever stumped, the oxidation state of the most electronegative atom is the one that you can predict that it's going to be whatever you expect it to be from the periodic table. So I'll, 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 let me show you an example of that. If we were to have carbon tetrabromide, maybe there's some doubt about what those are. Well, bromide is the most electronegative of those two elements. You know, it's, it's further to the right on the periodic table. So we can predict that bromide is going to be negative 1 because that's what the periodic table would tell us it would be. And we got four of those, so you know, 4 at negative 1 apiece, that's negative 4. The carbon would have to be positive 4 to cancel that out. Nitrogen trifluoride, once again, maybe we're stumped on here. So we can say the fluor fluorine is the most electronegative of those two. So it's what you would expect it to be from the periodic table, which is a minus 1. And we have three of those for a total of negative 3, which means the nitrogen would have to be positive 3 to cancel that out. Now, you, you probably wouldn't have expected nitrogen to be positive 3 by looking at the periodic table. But from the other rules here, we can figure out that that's actually what it is in this compound. Or how about phosphorus pentachloride? You know, chlorine is the more electronegative of those two elements, so we would predict chlorine to be negative 1. We got 5 of those, so that's negative 5. And so for this to cancel out, phosphorus would have to be positive 5. So hopefully you can see the, the way this works here. We use what we know to figure out what we don't know of these oxidation states. So let's determine the oxidation state of all atoms in the following species. So we'll start with the nitrate ion. And once again, we're going to use what we know to figure out what we don't know. And sometimes it's nice to work this as a little algebra problem. So I'm going to set this up as a little math problem here. Oxygen is a minus 2. And so as I set up my problem, I don't know what nitrogen is, so I'm going to call that x. So I'll write the x down here. There are three oxygens at negative 2 apiece, so that's where my negative 6 comes in. And the whole thing adds up to negative 1. That's what this little uh, the negative sign tells us there. So there's our negative 1. You solve for x, and x is positive 5. So that's how that works. Or we could look at sodium dichromate. Now, we know that sodium is going to be positive 1. We learned that. We got two of those. We don't know what that chromium is. It's a transition metal, so it could be one of several things. Oxygen's a negative two. And we have seven of those. So when you write the equation, 
we have two sodium, so we'll call that plus two. We don't know what the chromium is, but we have two of them. Let's call that 2x, since there are two of these. And then we have seven oxygens at negative two apiece, so that's negative 14. So we'll have the plus two, plus 2x, minus 14 equals zero, because this is a compound. All compounds are neutral. They have that zero charge. So when you do the math on this, we get 2x minus 12 equals zero. 2x equals 12. Looks like our chromium has a charge of positive 6, so we can identify that. You probably wouldn't have guessed that just by looking at the periodic table. So we have to figure out the oxidation state. Let's try a couple more examples here to finish up. Determine the oxidation state of all atoms in the following species. So here we have sulfur dioxide. Once again, use what you know to figure out what you don't know. So oxygen is a minus 2. We don't know what sulfur is, so we'll call that x. So we'll have x minus 4, you know, because two oxygens would be negative 4, equals 0. So it looks like the sulfur is a positive 4 in this case. We can determine that. You might not have needed an algebra problem to figure that out. You could possibly have just said, you know, we've got two of these at minus two apiece, and so the sulfur would have to be plus four. Hey, that works too, doesn't it? Let's try carbon disulfide. Well, carbon is the one we don't know, so we'll call that X. Sulfur, we know, it's minus two, uh, because it's the most electronegative. You know, it's farther to the right on the periodic table, so we can pinpoint that sulfur is a minus 2. And we can plug this in here. So x and then minus 4 equals 0. So looks like carbon is going to be a positive 4. Notice how these two examples are different. In the first example that we had over here, we knew what oxygen was. And it's the most electronegative. So it was, it was the one that we could go to first and say it was a minus 2. In this other example, Sulfur was the most electronegative atom, so that was the one we could go to first, since it was minus two. Okay, so use the most electronegative atom as the one that you are sure of, and then solve for uh, any others. Here's our last example. We have the sulfate polyatomic ion. Looks like the one that we're most sure of here is the oxygen. That's a minus two. And so we'll solve for the sulfur again. So sulfur, we'll call that X, and then four oxygens would be minus eight, and the whole thing adds up to minus 2. That's where our ion comes in there. And so when you solve for x, it looks like the sulfur is positive 6 in this case. So this is an interesting case. We had sulfur in all three of these. But notice that in every case, sulfur had a different charge, had a different oxidation state. It was positive 4, and then later it was negative 2, and here it's positive 6. You probably couldn't have predicted that just by looking at the periodic table. So hopefully, in this video, you've learned how to determine oxidation state for any uh, element in any compound or ion. If you learned something, please smash that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. Ring that bell. Once again, as we go through the AP Chemistry Complete course, I want you to get a 5 on your exam. So please join me where we can learn some more chemistry together. More chemistry.